connected to it. Hold on, we might have died again. Yeah, you died again. What? No, no, no. Okay. No, okay. We're, we're good. We're good. Okay, good. I didn't get Sorry. a notification this time. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, so check us out. So we're in debug mode, and so we're, we 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 paused execution here, and now we can evaluate this data structure that got parsed from everything that came here. And so let's pull that up. Sorry, I don't think I can increase the font size in this window or down here. Um, so I'm sorry, this is a little bit on the small side, but but here you can see this is really just a structured representation of the data message that we were getting from that stream. And from here, we can you know look at the um, you know look at look at the logs, right? This is this is the log. This is the first log in it, and we can see that this log topic is you know zero x d seven eight a d, and so we actually got kind of lucky here because remember that. So I'm actually going to copy this value because when I undelete this code, just going back to the way it was before, the first thing we do is we say, hey, is is that first log this? And if you look at it, it's that, right? So we got lucky in that we actually, the first message we processed was one that we would be interested in. It is a log message that gets emitted when a swap occurs on a Uniswap, um, on, on, a, on a Uniswap pair, right? So that, this is the way that we use that partial data to conditionally move forward or not move forward with, with processing. Um, so. You know, just like before, so we're going to look at data logs i address. You know, we can see this address here. Again, you probably can't see it very well, but that is a Uniswap pair address, right? Saying, oh, this this address emitted a a, a log, right? So let me see if I can actually copy that. I can even go look it up, right? So this is how you would kind of create your own custom searcher logic. So I'm going to copy that value. I'm going to come over to my browser. Look at it. Yeah, so here we have a Uniswap B2 pair. And remember that, I said that, that D78, remember I said that 0x D78 topic? That maps to this swap function. So it's like this is what we are targeting. We're targeting a swap having occurred on, um, you know, in, inside of that transaction. And But if we go back here and look at the rest of it, it's like, oh, well, we don't even know how much. See, it kind of, it, it zeroed all, all these values, so you don't know how much is being swapped here? You just know that swap is being called. These have been anonymized. Right, so we have the address of the pair we're interested in. We use- What's like, the token oh, in that pair? Oh, the token, <laughs> good question. Yeah. Oh, it's not a, it has a decent amount of a, uh... oh, Benito. Just kidding, I have no idea what that mm -hmm. is. But, but yeah, so it's like, you know, we, we know this is the Benito token. And so, you know, as we check the pool, we can now query it for you know what its tokens are. Is one of the is one of the tokens worth? Well, come over here. We know that's true. One of them is worth, right? It maps to these this contract, like th these these contract addresses over here. These contract values over here, uh, right? Token zero, token one, that's worth, um, right? So we're gonna we're gonna fall to the next part where we return the tokens that we extracted, and we say, hey, you know what if this this was Uniswap, right? If we if we if we see that Uniswap is what this token is, in case it will be, right? Because the factory that created it, again, which is a function call over here, um, right? This function call that maps to the the, the Uniswap factory. Um, then you know what? Here's the tokens you're interested in. By the way, go check go check Sushi. Go find the Sushi address for this so we can pass it in. So, but we're back in index now. Okay, right, this is that, we're, we're actually paused in execution right here. So yeah, we, we know the tokens, we know one of the, uh, we know the other side of the arbitrage that we should check. We go and find the pair address for, in this case, it will be Sushi for these two tokens. Once we have that first pair and second pair, <coughs> all that's left is taking these and bundling them up into two different bundles that go to the um, that go to the matchmaker. And the reason it's two um, is the way that we structured this is when we saw one transaction, like, hey, let's try to go sushi to uni and then let's try to go uni to sushi. We made those two different bundles. 
you, you could make them the same transaction, but you kind of have a, an advantage here where you can kind of save gas. You only need to check one thing or the other because the entire transaction will be excluded and you'll have used less gas in the one that succeeds. Yeah, I think this is another good time to point out um, like the logic behind uh, gas optimization and uh, separation of, of information here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so like on, you know, to get the most gas efficient execution, I mean, ideally you just want to be doing the least amount of computation. So I think the best way to design your contract in this case is you want to have one function for each sort of logical path. Uh, so you would have, uh, like one optimization I can think of is if you know, the token is, uh, like if you know on the pair wrapped ether is token zero. Um, then you can have in your in your smart contract like one function for when the token is uh, zero and one for when weth is token one, um, and that way you're you're cutting out an if statement in your execute function um, because you can get that data off chain. So like in any case where you can get that data off chain, uh, you want to do that. Um, yeah. 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 Exactly. Right. So there's. There's extra gas that a system like MEV share incurs because you need to do more calculations on chain, on chain but you can combat that with the, the gas savings that systems like MEV share can, can give you because you can just give a whole bunch of bad transactions to it and one good one, and you don't need to have all this if logic in the transaction that actually lands on chain, right? You don't pay gas for anything that doesn't land on chain, and so you can do all your, all your checks and fail and then not pay for any of that gas and only have the one that landed on chain that didn't even check anything because it knew it was going to succeed because it ended up succeeding. Um, so at this point we have the um, the pair addresses, right? So this is going to be like the, the Uniswap pair and, and the SushiSwap pair and then the transaction hash that is the user target transaction, right? So this is like it's passing in this transaction hash here, not the actual transaction details because we don't have it but the hash that we use as an identifier when we feed this data back into MEV share. And if we, if we look at this, there's really not much to it, right? It just, it, it figures out, it just creates these using the, the standard ethers library, right? It's just this contract populate transaction, just a way that you, um, you know, create the call data for a, for a call without sending it to the, the mempool. So this is how you kind of just create your transactions and keep them in memory. And all that it does is, you know, it creates one transaction where it tries to arb first pair to second pair, and a second where it does second pair to first pair. Creates these two bundles, right? Remember, hash and then an actual signed transaction. That's what this looks like over here, right? We have the hash and the signed transaction. It formulates those in the format that the MEV share um, matchmaker expects. Um, yeah, and then it just puts them into the format this is just the protocol format that the matchmaker wants, the MEV share matchmaker wants, right? So we'd say like, hey, you know, I want you to start, you know, I want you to include this up until this block. You eventually want to, you know, stop, right? You don't want to sit there and try to have this included for a thousand blocks. There's some limits there anyway. And and this this body bundle is that um, set of of transactions that we wanted to pass in, right? The, the hash and then the real signed transaction. And so really this is all just kind of like under the hood stuff for how you get your bundles to the matchmaker in a way that it understands. Um, I'm kind of going back here, right? So we're, we're back at the index, right? So all that this really is is saying, hey, create those two bundles and send them to the matchmaker to see if one of them is profitable, targeting the transaction that I discovered that had that log in it. And that's all it does. This is, this is, that's the end of the loop, right? That's the end of what you do when you find a message coming from this message source that has a, what is it, D78? Yeah, that, that has this on there. You sit there, you take that and another pair that has the same tokens on it and you see if there's an arbitrage opportunity afterwards. If there is, you land, you pay the builder, the builder pays most of it to the user, but the amount that you pay the builder doesn't have to be 100% of the profits. That's like in, in, in the example we had over here where that this user landed a transaction. This is just like we're talking about here. This is one of the transactions that was signed using a system like simple blind arbitrage. 
They sent this to the builder. They kept this for themselves. You take out the transaction fee, they made 0.034 in that, um, in this bundle, and the user made 0.038. So like everybody wins. Right, the Scott, you have somebody asking if we can show the code uh, that read TX is from MevShare again quickly. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, I mean, the thing is there's so little code. <laughs> like it's, it's, like, it's like here, right? So this event, um, here, let me actually, let me, let, me re, let me pause this. Let me, let me put a breakpoint here. So the code that reads it is just creating an event source. This just knows how to read an HTTP stream like we have over here. That's all it is. Like remember the stream over here? New event source on that, right? We're on, we're on mainnet. This, see this value is just that URL that I'm looking at. And then you just say, hey, event source, whenever you get a message, right? This is kind of a, a built-in um, uh, a, a built-in like node function. Whenever you get a message through that endpoint, I call this function and then it's gonna end up here. So in this case, all that we're doing is, okay, we've got a debug point here. So the event that came in is this Right here, see that? This, this is what came in. This is one of the ones that doesn't actually share anything, but it still came in as a JSON message. We parse that, step over that, step over that, look at. Now you just parse it into a message and now we can evaluate it. So, I mean, the, the whole thing is just this really set it up, get a call back, parse the data that comes back. Now you can do whatever you want. Let's see if this one has more, right? So I'm just, I'm hitting play again, nothing. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty common um, pretty common path that people just don't share anything. But from the, when they do, they share. Here you go. Here's one that's shared. Oh, look at all, a ton of stuff. Yeah, so this one shared a whole bunch of logs. It's probably a big swap. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's die right there. I don't know. Uh, oh, that's die. That's USDC. Yeah, a bunch, bunch of new stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I think that's tether. Maybe. Uh, yeah. let's see, tether's DAC. Uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah, I see there. But anyway, yeah. So that's how you parse it. You just parse it with really these these three lines, and then how you react to it, and the data you extract out of the logs or the function signature or the call data, whatever it is that's present, and the ideas you have for what to pass in afterwards back to the matchmaker um, is, is really what what these searchers are all about and kind of like where if you have new ideas for how to do this or better ways for how to do these, like that's where that's where your edge comes from. What's um, somebody asks in the, in the chat, Breeze asks in the chat, what are some special cases of MEV that you guys have imagined would occur from the system that have not occurred yet? I mean, I think the Oracle update that happened a couple of days ago, that's one we've been talking about a lot because Oracle updates historically have generated like a ton of NMEV that people fight for for blocks, right? This used to be um, like liquidations on Maker where, hey, guess what? The new price of, of ETH is now 1,000. All of these... Um, all of these maker positions are now underwater and now there's just a race to liquidate them because there's, a, there's like a large MEV there. But the thing that happened two days ago was it was a, an, an, an Oracle update for like, um, like, a, like a token. Uh, I think it was like a token kind of becoming like available for transfer. And so, um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a cool one to see. And especially since it did just like we expected it, it was a large one. I don't know, do you have any ideas for other MEV that we expect to see from the system? Oh, this is a good one. I think an, an interesting thing is, is there's lots of meme coins that are launching right now. And oftentimes they get sniped by token snipers that are willing to pay, you know, huge bribes in order to be the first person um, to snipe a token that's launched. And you could have a, a team that launches their token through MevShare instead, and searchers are bidding for the right to background it. But the profit uh, of backrunning the token launch goes to the, um, the team. you know the user that's actually launching the thing instead of just the builder or a searcher. So you can actually internalize the the value of the backrunning war if your thing's going to get backrun anyway. 
and it can help you, you know, more fairly price what your uh, your token launch should be, since you can take those ETH profits from the auction and kick it back to your LP. I think that is very interesting. Um, and that's not really something you can do in the usual mempool or the, the usual way that I mean, MEV works, like totally model. Um, yeah. Well, what else is really interesting? I'm trying to think. I mean, I think one of the, the largest, you know, there's a lot of MEV in NFTs, but NFTs are, are kind of difficult to operate. In, in systems where you're kind of blind because, you know, you know, it's like, hey, somebody is buying or selling, you know, a, a board eight, but like, which one? Like, you know, is there is there a way that you can, you know, operate on that information? I think that that'll it'll be interesting to see what people do with partial information um, for for NFTs or whether NFT wallets want to make sure their users get more kickback for their transactions. Maybe then maybe the wallets when they interact with NFTs was like, oh, you know, we're doing an NFT like I'll I'll leak a little bit more, right? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell the matchmaker that, Hey, yeah, why don't you leak my function signature? So you at least know that I'm buying or selling or, um, you know, there, there might, I, I think that the ecosystem that kind of evolves around how the decisions are made for what to share. I think that's going to be interesting and kind of as users get these kickbacks, right? Like that user got 1.2 kickback or this point of 0.038. So I think that's going to start to get users thinking about, I used to give these away for free and, and I don't have to anymore. And then, services that can figure out should you be leaking this data or not and, and how that gets automated. I think it's going to be a, a cool development. Yeah. We also haven't talked about uh, bundle nesting, yeah. searcher, searcher collabs. Yeah. But we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't seen that actually happen yet. But I think that one is going to be probably the most interesting. Is it live about our matchmaker? Yeah, yeah, bundle, bundle, yeah, bundle nesting works. Yeah, do you, do you want to talk about it, Brock? Sure. Yeah. Um, essentially, I, I'd say it pretty much looks just like a transaction when you see it from the from the SSE stream. It'll just have, you know, hash and whatever else you decide to include. Um, what's interesting is the like, say you say you leak logs. The, the logs will come from your entire bundle, um, but they also inherit the privacy settings from from whatever transactions are uh, in the bundle. Mm. Right. So, like if if you're uh, like if you pick up somebody else's transaction and back run it, and their transaction was fully private, um, then you won't be able to leak uh, their data out of the system. You, you could see like an attack vector on this, right? Like if if we didn't inherit the privacy settings, um, then you could just you know take every transaction and and leak all you know call data and logs and then just leak that as a bundle, then read it yourself again, and then operate with full information. So it, we need to like take the intersection of the privacies. Uh, but given that, um, you know, searchers. Uh, say you like don't have the most efficient bot, right? Like maybe you're doing a, a uni v3 v2 uh, arb and you're just using uh, like some crude estimation. So you might be leaving a little money on the table. Um, somebody else, you, you could decide to share that bundle with MEV share uh, or the matchmaker. And somebody else could come in and see that and maybe they have a more efficient bot or maybe they're uh, taking a bunch of orders and aggregating them into into larger bundles. Well, or, or or if I can chime in here, I think that one of the things we're saying a lot is that there are some people who are willing to buy a token and then sell it on a centralized exchange. Then other people don't want to do that, right? Other people can't get an account on the exchange. They don't want to deal with a centralized exchange. And so sometimes the back run of like you know that 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 searcher operated perfectly. It left this one pool out of sync. And that somebody else would love to buy those tokens to go sell them on a centralized exchange that isn't available to the person who created that first bundle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's tons of, there's, there's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, I th you know, it's like we talk about decentralized block building and this is kind of like bundle nesting is sort of a, like a first step in that direction. I mean, if you have, if you have somebody 
who's really good at aggregating orders uh, and they can do it at scale. Like that's essentially block building. Yeah. The question is like, how do you do that with imperfect information? There's kind of a balancing act. Yep. Um, so I think we forgot to cover from the user standpoint, what you, how, how you would end up sending to the matchmaker in a way that leaks more or less information. And the way you do it is just to use Flashbots Protect, but with hints on your URL, right? The, 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 when you add a URL for Flashbots Protect to MetaMask, you'll include, you know, it normally looks like this, but you can include these arguments here that say like, ah, you know, I want to leak my call data. I want to leak my logs. And um, like this is, this is how those systems end up getting in here with this data that is, um, that is partially shared. I think in the future wallets will start making this call. Like that's going to be like one of the, um, one of the benefits of like wallets or, or RPCs. They can kind of look at a transaction and be like, I know what kind this is. I, I kind of figure out what they're going to want. I don't think users are going to want to make that determination every time. But I think that there's going to be part of the service related to sending transactions is going to be figuring out automatically what the right privacy level is for these transactions. Uh, anything else? Uh, how long was this? Are, are we at time here, or was this an hour and a half? Uh, we got time. Maybe okay. we'll we'll do five or ten more minutes of questions. If anyone has any anything they they want to want to say or talk about in the chat. Juan Sonogo, I think that's how you pronounce your name. Um, says, any plans for a Golang library for Matchmaker? Brock, any plans for Golang library? We didn't even talk about Matchmaker, by the way. Oh, yeah, Matchmaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Golang library. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, we don't have any plans, like, set in stone. But um, we have this TypeScript library. I know a couple people are writing one for Rust already. Um, I imagine it will probably come out of the community before we have time to do it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we saw before with the, the original Flashbots Ethers provider. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of code that goes into this. I think it's worth, I mean, it's, um, so by, one thing to mention is that this, this thing we just looked at here, this is the simple blind arbitrage strangely doesn't actually use this matchmaker library um you know if you look at this uh, even though it's called Everybody. matchmaker yeah even though it's called matchmaker as a variable all it is is a raw event source and then remember when i was like oh yeah look at all this magic happening over here in bundle executor if you if you use that matchmaker ts you don't need to write any of this stuff right all this like oh you know i want this thing needs to do a json rpc request like that's the kind of stuff that gets handled by matchmaker or, um matchmaker ts I mean, yeah, I think Go Library would be awesome. Um, and yeah, we saw people from the community make those for the, um, for the thing. But it's not that hard to do without a library either, right? If you're, if you're just using Go and there's no library, I mean, it's probably about, I don't know, 20 extra minutes of, of work. And most of that is just, I think, reading the, um, the, the format that goes into, um, yeah, kind of just like reading how this, uh, the, the, the matchmaker mm. accepts the JSON RPC. But there's not much to it. I honestly just did not want to handle integrating a TypeScript library into a JavaScript file or writing my shit in TypeScript. I don't, I don't know TypeScript as well as I know JavaScript. So I'm sorry to not use your library, Brock. That's why it's not handled here. That's good. I think it's uh, it's valuable to see just how simple this yeah. SSE stream is just by you know by implementing it yourself. Like yeah, it's it's really not complicated and and the uh, the RPC uh, formatter, that's just the, you could just copy that out of like the, I mean, any one of the libraries. It's just our standard uh, signature scheme. So we got a couple questions in chat. 
the sim does says is payment to user prioritized or payment to builder for most share. Uh, yes. So at the builder, in theory, they choose the the bundle that pays the user the most, and uh, the incentives are aligned here because uh, when we send mesh our bundles to builders, there's a field that says uh, uh, refund 90% of the value or X percent of the value to this address, and the rest of it goes to the builder. Um, so in theory, if you have a more valuable bundle, both the user and the builder get more value, uh, you know, if their refund is set to be the same thing. Yeah. Ranaway asks, can you leak fake information and pollute the stream? Uh, you cannot ran away. So you set your hints. Uh, at your RPC or directly, if you're directly interacting with the, um, the matchmaker, and the matchmaker derives the information to leak itself. So unless the matchmaker was, uh, you know, behaving maliciously, yeah. you are trusting the matchmaker, I guess, to say what the hints are. Correct. Yeah. Um, right. Exactly. But, so you, uh, yeah. You don't you don't say what the call data is. You just say like, hey, tell people what the call data is, and then when those transactions come in, it looks at the call data and sends that out. Yeah, so I responded to this in chat. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by fake information. Uh, it's like if you if you expose some logs. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know how how would you really fake that? I mean, you know, you, if you can check the contract address and you can check the logs or. You, you, would have to, you have to do uh, some stuff. Yeah, sure. So okay, we're getting into some, some nitty gritty. Well, 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 we we, we, we may not uh, want to give people information on how to fix stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the interest of transparency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you should probably check on chain to make sure that your your transaction is actually profitable. Is what I would say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The yeah. the manager will not lie about logs that it sees, but um, you know someone's smart contract that they're interacting with might. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, but if you're yeah. checking profitability on chain, I mean, and you revert your transaction, I mean, even if the matchmaker tried to bring it to the chain, it wouldn't do. It wouldn't execute the code, right? Your your revert rolls everything back. So, you know, you have because your transaction comes afterward. You know, you have final say in whether your transaction executes or not, right? And so. I think that was the worst thing that's going to happen is you send these bundles to the you know to, to the to the MV share pool like the matchmaker as we're calling the matchmaker right you send these there and they just don't execute but that's like what's probably going to happen most of the time right so it's not it's not even that much of a trolling vector you're used to sending transactions that don't land because you're just you're just kind of like guessing what might work that's a very common Let's see what else we got here. Um, what are the possibilities to reduce searcher spam on the matchmaker? Sidestep, thanks for your question. What do you guys think? Reduce spam. I mean, I, I probably the probably the best way to reduce spam is to find a way to charge for um, simulation time, right? To make it like a, you know, it's like, hey, you know, this if you're incurring, you know, a millionth of a cent of, of of, of CPU cost to, to simulate it, just make, if, if you can just find a way to, I think, push that out to the, the users, then it's like, oh yeah, go ahead and spam, right? There's there's a way to um, to do that. We've seen that with other pools as well. I'm not sure if that's being considered for our product, but that was one idea. Not, not something that's on the roadmap though. I think one thing that's interesting is if you send us a transaction and uh, this isn't a feature that we have right now, but we could have a feature where you send us a transaction and you tell us, hey, put this behind Oracle updates for, uh, you know, the compound, um, whatever Oracle that like compound uses or something, or put this, you know, only behind curve uh, USDT, USDC trades, something like that. It's more like, an, like a standing but, order as opposed to like just getting it all the time. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, there, yeah. there is a way yeah, well, we deal with spam. Hold on, we do have a spam mechanism, and that is reputation, right? We we yeah. we do reputation, which is you sign all the payloads you send with another private key, and as you land bundles, you end up going into different priority queues, and 
if you are landing lots of bundles, you are going to get evaluated potentially, you know, sooner, right, or faster, just based on 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 on, on how your prior history has has been. It only really work. It only matters in um, periods of high high load. I think. Yeah. All right. Other questions. Um, let's see. Breeze says, "How do you plan on mainstreaming the system?" What do you mean, Breeze? For our users, for our searchers. I mean, I think it's it's like a marketplace, right? The marketplace like kind of becomes like self self promoting, or, or, or you know. It's our job to make sure this gets self right? The more order flow you have, the more searches you have, the more profit. I think that becomes kind of this um, recursive thing. And so like we're for everyone, yeah. I, I just think all we need to do is make, make sure that it has enough volume on, on everything, on the searching side and on the, um, you know, on, on, on the, the order flow side to, to make it profitable for all the parties, right? Because all the, all the interests are aligned. Yeah, there is, there is an API endpoint to check your reputation. Um, Let's get user stats right. Do we? Yeah. Have we finished uh, integrating reputation from MevShare or I'm Matchmaker sure. into know. that? I think that might still be in progress. Yeah. Aiden Khan asks, "Can you please shed some lights on how to protect the private keys?" No, Aiden. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I will say. <laughs> Those pro I, I, I have some light I'd like to shed. Um, you know, it should really just be gas. You know, don't. You only need to sign transactions that can like operate on on gas, and because of the protections on the contract, you could have the owner be a much more secure account, the one that might actually own funds that are that are on that contract, and you should only need to keep enough on there for you know for a very small amount of gas, which normally is a pretty small amount of ETH. And um, yeah, I think that just finding like a tiered system like that means that even if you, even in the worst case, you could be out like a very small amount, you know, if you were constantly refilling it. And, I mean, make it so that anybody who calls it, make, calls your contract, can't drain any money unless they have like the more secure account, right? It's like calling it with like first pair, second pair, if it's not profitable, it reverts. So you're not going to do anything except for, you know, potentially waste all that gas. Yeah, environment variables. Yeah, make, but you know, it's 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 hot, right? It's hot in memory somewhere. So it's not. I do not have that. Should that should be a separate account that is only used for gas, not for withdrawals. All right. What else we got here? Maybe we'll take two more questions. How do you know if you get outbidded on your bundle? Um, you don't right now. We're working on some APIs to help. Yeah, we, we do have a little bit here. Um, but we could talk about this. This is probably one of the cooler, this is a cool function. Um, uh, where is it? Matchmaker? So in the Matchmaker TS, we have this simulate bundle. And the funny thing about simulate bundle is that you can't do it. Right, so simulate bundle basically, you know, kind of takes these two transactions and says, "Hey, run this transaction, then run this transaction, and tell me what would have happened." The problem is you don't have this transaction; you have this transaction hash. And so this is a function that we wrote that will actually wait for that transaction to potentially land on chain. It'll just sit there and pull for it every block. And once it finds out what that transaction is, then you can run this simulate function, or it'll, it'll, that promise will return, and you'll be able to like, "Oh." Now the transaction is, let me grab it and then simulate these two transactions in a row and then you could see what happened. And if you discover that that transaction that you were targeting landed in somebody else's bundle instead and yours succeeded with it and would have paid a certain amount, you could figure out like, oh, well, you know, they paid a certain amount, I paid a certain amount. Was I paying more and something went wrong or was I paying less or not enough? Or you know, it gives you a chance to evaluate the actual on-chain landing behaviors if you just wait for this tr this transaction to eventually become public, which is very likely, right? These these things normally become public eventually, right? Because even if they don't land with a searcher, they're gonna they, like, they also go to the more conventional, just like landing without. So you can eventually simulate. Uh -huh. And then he's asking, 
Um, how do I know if I got outbid? Um, so Amazing. yeah, like we we want to we like in Mev Boost we have a function called get conflicting bundle. It's in the Ethers provider bundle uh, library, and and that will look uh it'll look for the uh, target transaction uh, and sort of in the same way. It wait, waits till it's included on chain, uh, and then it'll look up uh, all the bundles in the blocks API, uh, which are also on chain now, and it will just run through and simulate against uh, each bundle until there's a conflict found. So, like, we want something similar for this, um, but some upgrades. I yeah, think the, need to happen on the back end. The APIs aren't there. Actually, we have a pull request that we're looking at right now that's going to expose bundles. So when you, you know, we have Blocks API, right, that you use to, uh, um, yes, yeah, so we have this, this Blocks API that uh, you can query for bundle information from our, our builder. Um, I think that'll be enough. Right, so you can get bundle information from our builder. This currently does not include the, um, the matchmaker bundles, but it will very, very shortly. Right? We have the code written for it. We just need to check it and deploy it. But pretty soon, what you can do is like, hey, you know, the bundle, the, the transaction that I wanted to land landed in this block. You can go and check the blocks API for, was it a part of a bundle or did it just land naturally? Because that's those are kind of two different paths you would need to evaluate separately to see to why that happened. But the, the, you know, there is information that gets exposed about how these things actually landed on chain. And it'll be added to that shortly. You all can uh, feel free to stay on. I unfortunately got a drop. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in, at least to listen to me talk. Uh, thank Brock and Scott for joining us today. Feel free to stay on if you want. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. See you, Bert. All right. You want to do a couple more questions? Sure, sure. And yeah, we can wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, here. Okay, I like this trans this this question here. Um, transactions that hint only TX hash are essentially private since you can't act upon them, right? So, in that in that case, um, I, I think I mentioned this at the top of the the talk, but there was a large the, the largest payout we had actually was from a transaction that only shared TX hash, and it was from a an an Oracle update, but the the searcher knew the approximate time frame that it was coming out and so it just took its bundle let's come over here right it's it's you know every time it got something regardless of having nothing here it said this um do the thing i want right new transaction do the thing i want and so it just kept every time it got something for that that small period of time which i think was probably just about maybe 10 minutes it, it tried the bundle and it eventually it eventually landed and eventually it got to back run the transaction that it, it wanted um you know, and it paid a um you know a good like a good fee to the builder and a, and a good fee to the the originator of that transaction. So, you know, it is with current volumes, it's not it's somewhat feasible to, to do every transaction, um, but pretty soon, I mean, this kind of comes back to the other questions we had about um, you know, like denial of service and, and, and reputation and how we um, and, and how we deal with those going forward in a scalable way. Uh, currently, the rate I mean, there are rate limits based on um, a bunch of sources, right? Uh, for for any searcher doing normal things, I mean, you can see that right now the the volume of this. Let's go back to our MVV share, right? I mean, the volume of this isn't crazy, right? This isn't that bad. Um, you know, this is only brand new transactions that are coming in through, and they're on these are only ones that are coming in through the matchmaker. You know, this is order flow that we are working to um, working to improve. You know, but there are, you know probably you know tens of thousands a day something along those lines but not a not such a large amount that I think we need to be crazy worried unless you're doing like 10,000 transactions you know if this list of three is 10,000 then yes I think we have a problem but we haven't seen that yet and we'll address that when we get there mm -hmm. uh, can we pick the builder fee at runtime in the smart contract mm -hmm. or do we need to specify the fee when we send the transaction? Yeah, great one? question. Uh, yeah, um, so you can you can do it in your smart contract. Um, this is just block.coinbase.transfer uh, or whatever 
uh, method you prefer. Um, so yeah, like in the bot right now, like in the smart contract, you'll see that there's a calculation for like we find how much profit we have by checking the before and after balance, and then you do some math to calculate uh, how much the validator or the builder gets uh, as a Coinbase payment. Yep. So yeah, if you if you want to specify off chain, that uh, you can, um, but you know you have no way of knowing exactly how much profit you're getting out outside of that context. So. Um, yeah, depending on your strategy, you may or may not want to do that. Yeah, yeah, but right here, you're like, you know, you can execute EVM code and you kind of decide based on how much comes in is how is how much the Coinbase gets. So yeah, this is, and and normally when you do this, you submit your transactions with a zero priority fee. So you're not paying the miner anything. You're you're going to pay your base fee, but you don't pay the miner anything except for this, and that is still a valid transaction. And that's kind of a, a common way to do it, especially when you don't know how much um, profit there's going to be until you're at runtime. Um, I, I, and I know we mentioned this before, but it's important to compare this profit against how much gas you've spent. You know how much gas you've spent is available inside of um, inside the EVM, and that code's not here right now. Um, again, that's an exercise for the reader, but make you know there should be a a line here that says, "Hey, make sure that the profit is more than I spent on the base fee to get this transaction included. Otherwise, you have lost money. You have gained wealth, but lost." more than that amount of wealth in ETH on the executor account, right? On this, yep. um, yeah, the signer, right? This, this. Yeah. This and then, you know, you could like say, you, if you wrote the contract, you have a pretty good idea of how much gas it's going to consume for you know, one ARB. You can have sort of pretty accurate estimation there. Um, so you could pass this in as a function argument uh, if you know, like, I'm only gonna if like say if it's like really long tail, and you know that you're only you're the only one searching on that, um, then it might be better to pass your gas or your tip as an argument, um, save some gas. But if it's I don't know if it's that rare, I guess in this case it doesn't really matter uh, if you're gonna save a couple bucks or not. But yeah, dependent on the strategy. Uh, we had one question about an aggregator for relaying bundles to multiple relays. Uh, so, yeah, like we don't have an endpoint that does that right now, but I mean, we're doing something like that with the the DAOG. We didn't talk about the the DAOG at all. The DAOG. Yeah, I, I don't know a whole lot about the DAOG. I know it's the 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 the, the order working group, but is there any more to talk yeah, about? I don't know, it's the decentralized order flow working group. Uh, so yeah, the idea is like uh, in this group, uh, order flow is shared between parties, uh, and that'll increase inclusion rates. But this is still very like fledgling uh, idea uh, and something that we're building currently. Uh, by the way, I've been saying the wrong number this whole time. I forgot. It's not. It's not 1.2. It's 10.8. That was the that was the refund that the user got. 1.2 was the build with the builders.